Hello everyone and welcome back to the Dungeon Learner's Guide. This week we have another Commander's Guild deck tech. This is our 74th deck and it's titled Kavu Surprise. And if you haven't seen this show before, what we are doing is randomly selecting a card from scryfall.com, working with a budget of $100 or less, and building a commander deck for Magic the Gathering around a theme of the chosen card. Now really quickly, before we get into all of the actual deck tech, I do want to take a second to highlight some of our social media accounts. If you are interested in following us over on Twitter at 13POYNZ, Reddit u slash POYNZ13, or just sending us an email at dungeonlearnersguide at gmail.com. Those are all great ways to reach out to us if you ever have any questions or if you just want to talk or maybe you want to request some uh, decks to be played on this channel or cards to be turned into decks. Those are all great ways to do that. However, if you're looking to support us a little bit more directly, you can head on over to TCG Player and use our affiliate link, which is in the description for this video. Once you've clicked on that link, any cards that you buy, we get a little bit of a kickback from as just a thank you for sending you their way. And then the most direct way to support us is patreon.com slash dungeonlearnersguide, where you can give us a little bit every single month as a thank you for putting on some of the content. And also, this does give you access to things like a Discord channel where we build a lot of our decks and also play some of the games. So if you're interested in participating in some of the games, that is a great way to do that. You also get access to the deck lists a week early, the guarantee that any suggested cards you have will be turned into decks for the channel. Um, and then, of course, there's also the unedited gameplay videos where you get to hear all the commentary from the players and get to experience the game as it actually happened rather than the shorter edited version with just my commentary over it. So if that is something that you are interested in, that is a great way to help support us. And, of course, got to give a shout out to our current patrons. We have William Swiftfoot, we have Doodle, we have Observer Will, and we have Calvin Schmidt. So to the four of you, thank you all very much. And of course, if none of this is your style, or maybe you're just not really able to support with a financial donation every month, that is perfectly fine. I completely understand. You can always just like the video, subscribe to the channel. That does help out quite a bit. And with all of that out of the way, let's jump into our deck tech. And this week, we have a deck that was actually suggested to us by William Swiftfoot over on Patreon. And the card that he suggested was Marauding Raptor. So... Marauding Raptor is one and a red for a 2-3 dinosaur that says creature spells you cast cost one less to cast. And whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, Marauding Raptor deals two damage to it. If a dinosaur is dealt damage this way, Marauding Raptor gets plus two plus O oh until end of turn. Now, I'm not going to lie, when we start looking at our commander for this deck, I blew quite a bit of our budget on the actual commander because I wanted a very specific effect. And so our commander this week is Morophon the Boundless, which is 7 mana for a 6-6 six, six legendary creature shapeshifter. It's a changeling, so it's every creature type. As Morophon the Boundless enters the battlefield, choose a creature type and spells of the chosen type you cast cost one of each mana less to cast. This effect reduces only the amount of colored mana you pay. Other creatures you control of the chosen type get plus one plus one. Now, if you look at the two cards that we've got, we've got the Marauding Raptor, we've got Morif on the Boundless, this looks like we are building a five colored dinosaur deck. However, that's not actually gonna be the case. Yeah, I think five color dinosaurs would be pretty cool. You get access to all the elder dinosaurs. There's a lot of random synergies that could be had. But we're actually focusing on Marauding Raptor's first ability in making our things cost one less. So let me run you through some of our themes for this deck and I'll explain how all of that kind of ties together. So the first theme that we're going to have is, of course, going to be related back to our Marauding Raptor. We got to make sure that things cost a little bit less. So in that case, we have Centaur Omen Reader, which is three and a green for a 3-3 three, three Centaur Shaman. It's also a snow creature, so maybe someday that will be relevant. But as long as Centaur Omen Reader is tapped, creature spells you play cost two less to play. So if we had Centaur Omen Reader and Marauding Raptor in play and Centaur Omen Reader is tapped, 
all of our creatures cost three less to cast. That can be incredibly relevant, because if we're looking at something like Morophon, now he goes from costing seven to costing four, and that's a huge difference for this deck. We want to make sure that we reduce the colorless cost of all of our creatures to as low as we can get, preferably to zero, but that might not always be the case. And once we combine that with Morophon, we're not only reducing the colorless part of the casting cost for our creatures, but Morophon's going to be reducing the colored part of it as well. So, for example, if we have sent our Omen Reader and Marauding Raptor in play, we could cast anything that has three generic in its casting cost plus at least one of any other color for essentially free, provided it matches the creature type that we name with Morophon. And that's kind of our goal here, is to do something like that. So, that does lead us into our second theme though. We need to be able to manipulate our creatures' types. So we have Arcane Adaptation, which is two and a blue for an enchantment. As Arcane Adaptation enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Creatures you control are the chosen type in addition to their other types. The same is true for creature spells you control and creature cards you own that aren't on the battlefield. So we could cast Arcane Adaptation, name something like Centaur, all of our creatures become Centaurs, when Morophon comes in we name Centaur, and now Morophon is making every single creature we cast cost one color each less to cast, plus we have things like Marauding Raptor and Centaur Omen Reader, with the eventual goal of essentially casting all of our creatures for free. Now that is going to be very tricky, and that does kind of lead us to our last theme, which is going to be creatures that we want to cast for free, right? So we have things like White Mane Lion, which is one in a white for a 2-2 cat. It has flash, and when it enters the battlefield, return a creature you control to its owner's hand. This typically doesn't show up too often in Commander, and if it does, it tends to be like a protection effect, right? We could return something to our hand instead of letting it get destroyed, save something from a board wipe. But in this deck, White Mane Lion specifically says return a creature you control, not another creature. So White Mane Lion can return itself to its owner's hand. So if we have Arcane Adaptation, and we have said everything is, we'll say, a cat, and then we have Morophon, who also comes down and says everything's a cat. And then we have Centaur Omen Reader making stuff cost two less. White Mane Lion is free. 100% free. So we could cast White Mane Lion. It comes into play. It returns itself to hand. And we could actually infinitely cast White Mane Lion and bounce it back to our hand. Now, that doesn't win us the game on its own. And it certainly does make us look like a target. So, of course, we do have to add something to this that helps us win the game. That would be something like Impact Tremors that does one damage to something whenever a creature comes into play, whatever that may be. But as weird as it is, we have some key cards that almost effectively win us the game on the spot. And that's where a lot of our deck is leading us to. So the first one doesn't win us the game right away. It's Jota, Archmage Eternal. But what it does is it makes everything free as long as we have Jota plus Morophon. So Jota, Archmage Eternal, is one blue, red, white for a 4-3 legendary creature human wizard. It's got flying, and you may pay one of each color of mana rather than pay the mana cost for spells you cast. If we combine that with Morophon, which says everything costs one of each color less, everything is free as long as it matches the creature type on Morophon, which, if we have something like Arcane Adaptation, every single creature will, so just those two cards combined means our entire deck full of creatures are now free to cast. And we've kind of mentioned that we have like White Mane Lion that could kill things with Impact Tremors, but there are two specific cards in here that we really want to get to, and this is where the title of the video also comes from, the Kavu Surprise. You've noticed we haven't really talked a lot about Kavu so far, but that's because one of our two win conditions is a Kavu. The other one, a Zombie Wizard, a little bit less exciting when you say Zombie Wizard Surprise, so Kavu Surprise just kind of sounds better. But a Sararak, the Arch Lich, and Spark Caster are the two cards that we could cast infinitely because they bounce themselves to our hand, but they also win us the game without any other combo pieces. So for example, We'll start with Spark Caster because it's a little bit easier and it's the real reason that I went down this route. Spark Caster is two red green for a 5 3 Kavu. When Spark Caster comes into play, return a red or green creature you control to its owner's hand. 
spoiler, that's going to be the Spark Caster. And when Spark Caster comes into play, it deals one damage to target player. So if we can make Spark Caster free, so maybe we have Joda and Morophon after Morophon has named Kavu, or we have um, the Centaur Omen Reader, which reduces it by two, and then Morophon, who's named Kavu, so we don't have to pay the red and the green, whatever it may be. We cast Spark Caster for free, it comes into play, does one damage to an opponent, and then it bounces back to our hand. Then we cast it for free again, and we continue that cycle until the rest of the table is dead. Now, maybe we don't get Spark Caster, but we get the other card that does pretty much the exact same thing, a Sererak the Archlich, which is two and a black for a 5-5 five, five legendary creature zombie wizard. When a Sererak the Archlich enters the battlefield, if you haven't completed Tomb of Annihilation, return a Sererak the Archlich to its owner's hand and venture into the dungeon. I may not need to tell you this, but with a Sererak, you never want to go into the Tomb of Annihilation, because as soon as you go into the Tomb of Annihilation, you kind of ruin the Sererak plan, it stops bouncing back to your hand, you don't want that. Pick something else. Typically, we're going to pick the Lost Mine of Fandelver, because while you're going through the Lost Mine of Fandelver, you get to create a treasure, which could be relevant, you get to scry, which might also be relevant, you get to draw a card, which is always good, and the most important one, you get to drain each opponent for one every single time you go through the dungeon. So provided you have more cards in your library than your opponents have life, this also wins you the game. Now, Asarak does have a second line of text, um, and I'll be honest, I think I'm just now realizing that. But it does say whenever a Sererak attacks, for each opponent you create a 2-2 black zombie creature token unless that player sacrifices a creature. The reason that I've probably never read that ability is because it's not important for us. Um, the odds of us actually getting a Sererak down and having him stay in play are going to be very, very slim because that implies that we have completed the Tomb of Annihilation, which we don't want to do. So a Sererak and Sparkcaster are the two main win conditions in here because they're single card win conditions provided we have the rest of our support pieces. But we do have things like White Mane Lion and Ancestral Statue combined with um, Impact Tremors to make sure that we do have a backup just in case this doesn't work. And honestly, if we're not able to do this, maybe our opponents have Hexproof or maybe they're shutting down into the battlefield effects. We do still have Joda, who's a 4-3 flyer. We have a Sararak, who's a 5-5. Sparkcaster's a 5-3. So there is just a chance that if push comes to shove, we can kind of beat down our opponents to try to win. Because most of our creatures tend to be pretty large or pretty evasive. But enough about the key cards. This is, like I said, how we're trying to win. So let's move on and talk about some other cool synergies in the deck. Some interactions that work super well together. The first of which is going to be Shrieking Drake and the aforementioned Impact Tremors. So Shrieking Drake, again, a card just like White Mane Lion that returns itself or another creature to its owner's hand. So Shrieking Drake is only one blue for a 1-1 flyer. It's a Drake. When Shrieking Drake comes into play, return a creature you control to owner's hand. We could combine that with Impact Tremors, one in a red for an enchantment. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, Impact Tremors deals one damage to each opponent. Now, I know I mentioned this earlier, but I did want to put the cards up on screen to make sure that we all kind of understand what's going on. Impact Tremors is like the tertiary win condition. Um, and then Shrieking Drake is here in this slot just because it's the cheapest of the effects that bounce things to their owner's hands. Um, all we have to do is play Morophon and name Drake, and Shrieking Drake is now free because it's only one blue mana. So it's incredibly easy to get Shrieking Drake to just infinitely bounce to the field and back to our hand, and so we just need something like Impact Tremors to really make it an actual win condition. And our second cool interaction is going to be between Homing Sliver and Maskwood Nexus. So Maskwood Nexus, very similar to Arcane Adaptation, it's a 4 mana artifact. Creatures you control are every creature type, the same is true for creature spells you control and creature cards you own that aren't on the battlefield. And you can pay three, tap it, make a 2-2 blue shapeshifter creature token with changeling. And we combine that up with homing sliver, which is two and a red for a 2-2 sliver. Each sliver card in each player's hand has sliver cycling three. And sliver cycling three means that you can pay three mana, discard this card, search your library for a sliver card, put it into your hand. So if we have homing sliver in play, 
and we have Maskwood Nexus in play, that means every single card in our hand that's a creature, because every single creature is a sliver, can now pay three mana, discard that creature, and search our library for any other creature, because all of our creatures are slivers. So this is essentially just three mana, tutor for whatever creature we want as long as we have a creature in hand and that can be incredibly powerful when we're looking for something like Joda or we're looking for something like Shrieking Drake or we're just looking for something like Marauding Raptor to help us lower the cost of our creatures so Homing Sliver is an all-star especially when combined with Maskwood Nexus we don't have a ton of other slivers in fact I think there's only one other normal sliver in the deck so we do need something like maskwood nexus or arcane adaptation to really take advantage of this but it is powerful nonetheless and so finally that brings us to the end of our deck tech we got to talk about the price of this deck now this deck is incredibly incredibly close to our budget limit and honestly I can't remember a deck that we've done that was closer to the budget limit than this. We're only three cents away from $100. It is $99.97. And a lot of that, as I'm sure we are well aware of, is because of our commander, right? Morophon the Boundless, $19.16. And I would love to use one of the other five color commanders that's, you know, 25 cents or whatever to really lower the price of this deck, but. Unfortunately, there isn't a good replacement for Morophon. Morophon is the only way I found to reduce the colored mana of non-legendary spells, because something like Bard Class could reduce the green and red cost of spells, but only for legendaries. Morophon does it for everything, and yeah, it sucks to have to spend $20 on a single card. I mean, that's a fifth of our budget just on one card. But Morophon really is unique, and it's the only card that does what it does. Now, if you wanted to cut it and you wanted to try to make the deck work in some other way, I think that would be super cool. And if you know a way to do that, I would love to hear it. I think that would be super sweet. But if you decide you can't cut Morophon and you want to instead cut some other more expensive cards, I've got you covered there too. The next most expensive card that's not Morophon in the deck is actually Semblance Anvil, which is three mana for an artifact. It has imprint, so when it enters the battlefield, you may exile a non-land card from your hand, and spells you cast that share a card type with the exiled card cost two less to cast. So you'll notice that there's a huge drop off between our most expensive card and our second most expensive card, but that's because there's actually quite a few cards in the deck that float around between three to five dollars. Semblance Anvil just happens to be the next most expensive, but we have a ton of ways to reduce costs in this deck, so if you do need to cut Semblance Anvil to trim the price a little bit, that's not a bad cut to make, because there's plenty of things that do the same thing. Like we saw earlier, Marauding Raptor, Centaur Omen Reader, there are ways to do this. But on the other hand, maybe you're trying to increase the price of this deck, or you just want some cards that work really well with what we're doing. I've got you there too. So we have some out of budget upgrades, two in particular, one that's a little bit pricier than the other, and I'll explain what I would put into this deck if we had the budget for it, and what I would take out if given the chance. So the first one is Urza's Incubator, which is a massive $45 now, but Urza's Incubator is three mana for an artifact. As it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Creature spells of the chosen type cost two less to cast. This is incredibly powerful because it hits pretty much everything. Now, like I mentioned earlier, we do have a ton of things that reduce the cost of spells, so it's not super, super relevant to have this, but it is an upgrade nonetheless. And I would recommend taking out Council of the Absolute for it, which is two white blue for a 2-4 human advisor. As Council of the Absolute enters the battlefield, name a card other than a creature or land card, your opponents can't cast cards with the chosen name. Spells with the chosen name you cast cost two less to cast. Now, Council of the Absolute can be very powerful, but the downfall here is that we're really trying to make our creatures cost less, and Council of the Absolute does not hit creatures. So we could make some of our instants or sorceries or enchantments cost less, maybe something like Warstorm Surge, which is normally six mana, but it doesn't help us in going infinite with our creatures, so if you have the chance to replace it for something that does help us to do that, like Urza's Incubator, I would highly recommend that switch. 
The other out-of-budget upgrade, which is not nearly as expensive as Urza's Incubator, however, still pretty expensive, is Bantu's Monument, which is actually almost $5 now, $4.51, and it's three mana for a legendary artifact that says black creature spells you cast cost one less to cast. Whenever you cast a creature spell, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. Bantu's Monument is another infinite win condition in this deck. If we have White Mane Lion and Bantu's Monument, we win the game because White Mane Lion can infinitely return itself to our hand, we can recast it, and Bantu's Monument will drain each opponent for one. So this is another win condition that is incredibly powerful, but on the downside, it is almost $5, and I tried to figure out how to get it in there, but I just couldn't quite squeeze it through the budget. On the other hand, what I would replace is actually another monument, which is Kefnet's Monument, which is three mana for a legendary artifact that says blue creature spells you cast cost one less to cast. Whenever you cast a creature spell, target creature and opponent controls doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. So this can, again, be very useful because it's reducing the cost of our creatures, but the extra ability is more of an annoyance than anything else, and our opponents won't appreciate that we could keep their things tapped. And the real downside to this is that it doesn't actually tap the creature. It only keeps them tapped if they're already tapped. So unless we have a way to tap things, which we don't, I'll be perfectly honest, or our opponents are attacking us, there's no reason for us to be using this, and it really tends to draw a target on our backs. Every time I've played this card, people have gotten very annoyed by it and have kind of gone out of their way to either kill it or to make sure that they can kill me instead of having to deal with this. So I would recommend that if you're going to play the Monument, you might as well play the one that's an actual win condition, since they're both going to get you a little bit of flack anyway. But those are the only two out-of-budget upgrades that I would recommend. And so the last thing we've got to do with this deck is see how it actually functions in a game. So this week we got two games, um, and they're both going to be a little bit longer, so I do apologize for that. They both wound up being almost two-hour games on their own, so even just the edited-down versions, they're about 20 minutes per game. Um, but they are very good games, and I'm very happy with how they turn out. So first up. We have game number one, where we'll be playing against Chris, also known as One More Game, playing Essex Fractal Bloom. We have Finnegan playing Captain Ngatharod. I think that's how it's pronounced. If I'm saying it wrong, please let me know. And then we have Eddie playing Karth the Lion. So Chris's Essex deck is a token-style strategy. He wants to make a ton of tokens and wants to make sure that he's making very powerful tokens or copying some of the best creatures at the table and using that as a way to win. I think that will be mostly okay against this deck, but I am worried if he gets some big threats and some, you know, very wide boards worth of tokens very, very quickly. So that is something to watch out for. Um, Finnegan's Captain Nagathrod deck, I honestly couldn't tell you too much about this deck. I know it's a horror tribal deck. I know horrors tend to lean into the mill strategy, so I imagine both of those are going to be things to watch out for. But I've never played against Captain Nagathrod, so I really don't know what to expect, but I am very excited to see how it functions. And then finally, we have Eddie's Karth the Lion deck, which is a Super Friends deck. And I think it, this might go without saying, this is the one I'm most afraid of, personally. Uh, Super Friends is a very powerful archetype. Bilal frequently plays his Karth the Lion deck, which is incredibly powerful. I've actually lost to Karth quite a few times, so I'm more than aware of the power that Karth has, the ability to get extra loyalty counters on his Planeswalkers, the ability to keep searching up Planeswalkers when things die, is just incredibly powerful. So, very concerned about what Karth is doing over there, but we'll see how it goes. I hope we do a good job in this game. I hope the deck performs up to expectations, and I hope you all enjoy it as well, and I will talk to you all once it's done for game two. At the start of the game, Chris goes first, followed by Finnegan, myself, and then Eddie. On Chris's first turn, he plays a tapped Rhymewood Falls. Finnegan plays a Port of Carfell. I play an Exotic Orchard. Eddie plays a Forest and casts Arbor Elf. Chris plays a Spawning Bed and casts Crashing Drawbridge, which can tap to give all his creatures haste. Finnegan plays a Swamp and casts Talisman of Dominance. I play a Plains and then cast Thornscape Familiar, making all my red and white spells cost one less to cast. Eddie plays a Swamp 
and cast three visits, searching his library for a forest and putting it into play. With that, he casts a Sylvan Library, allowing him to draw three cards for his turn, but losing four life for each one he doesn't put back beyond the first. Chris plays a Dream Root Cascade. Finnegan plays a Myriad Landscape. I play a Forest and cast Orzhov Signet, followed by casting an Azorius Signet. I then move to combat and attack Eddie for two. When Eddie draws with the Sylvan Library, he keeps all three cards, losing eight life. He then plays a Command Tower and casts his commander, Karth the Lion, getting to look at the top seven cards of his library and put a Planeswalker from among them into his hand, this time getting Nyssa World Waker. It also allows him to add an extra loyalty counter to his Planeswalkers whenever he activates them. Finally, he casts an Elves of Deep Shadow and then passes. Chris plays a forest and casts a Mimic Vat, allowing him to exile any creature that dies and then make token copies of it. Finnegan plays a, an island and then casts Ravenous Chupacabra, destroying Karth when it enters. I cast an Arcane Signet and then cast Moon Blessed Cleric, searching my library for an enchantment, in this case Conspiracy, putting it on top of my library, then I play an island and pass. When Eddie draws with his Sylvan Library, he puts two back, losing no life. He then plays a Forest and recasts his commander, Karth, again looking at the top seven cards of his library, but unfortunately this time he doesn't find any Planeswalkers. Once that's resolved, he casts an Elvish Mystic and passes. Chris plays Novigen, Heart of Progress, and casts Mycoloth, devouring the crashing drawbridge when it enters to put two plus one plus one counters on it, allowing him to make two sapperlings at the start of his turn. This also lets Chris exile the drawbridge under the Mimic Vat for future use. Finnegan plays a Sunken Hollow and casts his commander, Captain Nagathrod, giving all his horrors menace, making his opponent's mill cards equal to the combat damage they take from horrors, and allowing Finnegan to put an artifact or creature from an opponent's graveyard into play under his control at the end of his turn, if it was put into the graveyard from the library this turn. He then attacks Chris for 2, and mills him for 2 when it deals damage. On my turn I cast Conspiracy, turning all my creatures in my deck regardless of zone into Kavu. I then play an Evolving Wilds, sacrificing it to search my library for a basic land, putting it into play tapped. When Eddie draws with Sylvan Library, he puts one back, losing four life, and then casts Nissa World Waker. Once that's resolved, he plays an Overgrown Tomb, tapped, and activates Nissa's plus one ability, giving her an extra loyalty from Karth and untapping four forests. This then lets him cast a Sakura Tribe Elder, and he passes. In Chris's upkeep, Mycoloth triggers, making him two Sapperling tokens. He then plays a Lumbering Falls and casts Mirror Hall Mimic, copying the Mycoloth, devouring the original Mycoloth and both Sapperlings, getting six plus one plus one counters. Finnegan plays a Swamp and casts Pilfered Plans, making me mill two while he draws two. After that, he casts a Mind Crank, making each opponent mill cards equal to the damage they take, and moves to combat, attacking me for 5, milling me for a total of 10 when his creatures do damage. Then at the end of turn, Finnegan puts my Centaur Omen Reader into play under his control since he milled it from my library this turn. On my turn I play a Plains, and then cast my commander Morophon the Boundless, naming Kavu when it enters to give all my Kavu plus one plus one, and also making them cost one of each colored mana less to cast. After that I cast a Stormscape Familiar, making all my black and white spells cost one less to cast, and move to combat, attacking Finnegan for four. Then, in my end step, Eddie sacrifices his Sakura Tribe Elder to search his library for a basic land, putting it into play tapped. When Eddie draws with Sylvan Library, he puts two back, losing no life. He then floats four mana and activates Nissa's plus one ability to untap the four forests he just tapped. 
This allows him to cast the Chain Veil, which can be activated for 4 mana, letting Eddie activate all his Planeswalkers again this turn, but it also does 2 damage to him at the end of turn if he hasn't activated a Planeswalker. He immediately activates the Chain Veil, allowing him to ultimate Nyssa, letting him search his library for any number of basic lands, in this case, all of them, putting them onto the battlefield and turning them into 4-4 elemental creatures with Trample. Notably, Nyssa survives the ultimate because Karth gives her an extra loyalty when she ultimates, putting her to 1. In Chris's upkeep, the Mycoloth clone triggers, making 6 one, one Sapperling tokens. He then casts a Pest Infestation, where X equals 2, destroying 2 artifacts or enchantments, and then making 4 Pest tokens. This has him destroying the Chain Veil and the Mind Crank. Finnegan plays an Island, and casts Leyline of Anticipation, allowing him to cast all of his spells at flash speed. I cast a Dormant Sliver, drawing a card when it enters, and then cast Commander Sphere, immediately sacrificing it to draw a card, before casting a Shrieking Drake, returning Moon Blessed Cleric to my hand when it enters, and then of course recasting the Moon Blessed Cleric, searching my library for an enchantment, in this case Warstorm Surge, and putting it on top of my library. When Eddie draws with Sylvan Library, he puts two back, losing no life, and then casts Blood on the Snow to destroy all creatures, and, in response, also casts Heroic Intervention to give all his permanents hexproof and indestructible until the end of turn. Luckily though, Finnegan has an answer, using Fierce Guardianship to counter the Heroic Intervention and forcing Eddie to wipe away his own board along with everyone else's. This lets Chris exile Moon Blessed Cleric underneath his Mimic Vat when it dies, and Eddie also returns Elvish Mystic from his graveyard to play, thanks to Blood on the Snow. Once that's resolved, he recasts his commander, Karth the Lion, revealing Obnixilis Reignited and putting it into his hand. He then casts the Obnixilis and activates Nissa's plus one ability, untapping four forests, and also activates Obnixilis's plus one ability, drawing a card and losing a life. Once that ability resolves, he casts a Golgari Signet, and finally casts Kaya's Ghost Form, enchanting Karth, bringing him back to the battlefield if he's destroyed or exiled. In Chris's upkeep, he activates Mimic Vat, creating a copy of Moon Blessed Cleric, and searching his library for an enchantment, which is going to be Kenrith's Transformation, putting it on top of his deck so that he can draw it for a turn. He then casts Kenrith's Transformation, enchanting Karth, turning him into a 3-3 elk with no other abilities, and also drawing Chris a card. Chris then moves to combat, attacking Finnegan with the Cleric for 3, and before blocks, Finnegan flashes in a Grell Philosopher to block, taking no damage. This also gives all horrors he controls the activated abilities of an artifact controlled by an opponent, and that ability also triggers in his upkeep. On Finnegan's turn, he plays an island and recasts his commander, Captain Nagatharod. He then attacks Chris for one with the Grell, milling him for one when it does damage, and at the end of turn, Finnegan puts Chris's spark double that he milled into play under his own control, copying the captain and putting a plus one plus one counter on the copy. On my turn, I simply recast my commander Morophon, again naming Kavu when it enters, and pass. When Eddie draws with Sylvan Library, he puts one back, losing four life, and then casts Reclamation Sage, destroying Kenneth's transformation when it enters play. He follows that up by casting Callous Blood Mage, drawing a card and losing a life. Then he ultimates Obnixilis, killing the Planeswalker and giving Chris an emblem that makes him lose two life whenever any player draws a card. Then, since a Planeswalker died, Karth triggers and lets Eddie look at the top seven cards of his library, putting Vrasco Golgari Queen from among them into his hand. He immediately casts the Vraska Golgari Queen, and activates her plus two ability to sacrifice Karth, returning him to play with Kaya's ghost form, looking at the top seven cards of his library and putting Tevish Zot Doom of Fools into his hand.
After that, he plays a Field of the Dead, allowing him to make a 2-2 zombie token whenever he plays a land if he has seven or more lands with different names. When Chris draws for his turn, he loses two life, and then casts his commander Essex Fractal Bloom, allowing him to create copies of another target creature the first time he makes tokens each turn. When Finnegan draws for turn, Chris loses two life, and Finnegan moves straight to combat, attacking Eddie for four with the copy of the captain, and attacks me for one with the Grell. Eddie blocks with Karth and Reclamation Sage, killing the Sage and the copy of the captain, while I take one damage and mill two cards. Then, at the end of turn, Finnegan puts my Nylea Keen-Eyed that he milled into play under his control, making his creatures cost one less to cast. When I draw for my turn, Chris loses two life, and I cast Kefnet's Monument, making my blue creatures cost one less to cast, and also allowing me to keep a creature tapped for a turn whenever I cast a creature spell. I follow that up with Warstorm Surge, doing damage to any target equal to the power of any creature that comes into play under my control. When Eddie draws with Sylvan Library, he puts one back, losing four life, but Chris loses six life. He then plays Yavimaya Cradle of Growth, making all lands into forests in addition to their other types. He also casts Freilis Lanowar's Fury, as well as Tevish Zot Doom of Fools. He quickly activates Tevish Zot's plus 2 ability, creating two 0 2 Thrall tokens, activates Nissa's plus 1 ability, untapping 4 forests, activates Vraska's plus 2 ability, sacrificing a Thrall to draw a card and gain a life, and make Chris lose 2 life, and then finally activates Freyalise's minus 2 ability to destroy Warstorm Surge. When Chris draws for his turn, he loses two life, and, still in Chris's upkeep, Finnegan sacrifices his myriad landscape to search his library for two basic lands, putting them into play tapped. Chris then activates his Mimic Vat, making a token copy of Moon Blessed Cleric, but uses Essex's ability to have it come into play as a Captain Nagathrod. He moves to combat, attacking Finnegan for three with the Captain copy, milling him for three when it does damage, and Tevish Zot for 4 with Essex. In his second main phase, he casts Biovisionary, and at the end of turn, Chris puts Forgotten Creation into play from Finnegan's Graveyard, and also has to sacrifice his copy of the Captain. Still in Chris's end step, Finnegan flashes in Reflections of Litjara, naming Horror, letting him copy any Horror spell that he casts. When Finnegan draws for turn, Chris loses 2 life, and Finnegan then attacks me for 3 with his commander, and attacks Chris for 4 with the copy of his commander. Then, Chris mills 8 and I mill 6. At the end of turn, the two commanders allow Finnegan to put Chris's progenitor mimic into play, copying the copy of Captain Nagatharod, and also my Ezerut channeler. When I draw for turn, Chris loses 2 life, then I simply play a forest, and pass. When Eddie draws for Sylvan Library, he puts two back, losing no life, but makes Chris lose six. He then plays an Agadim the Undercrypt, triggering Field of the Dead, making a 2-2 zombie. After that, he casts a Reiki the History of Kamigawa, letting him draw a card whenever he casts a legendary spell. He then activates Tevishzat's plus one ability, sacrificing a Thrall, drawing two cards, and making Chris lose four life. He also casts Silent Arbiter, ensuring that no more than one creature can attack or block each combat. He also ultimates Frasca, gaining an emblem that says whenever a creature Eddie controls deals combat damage to an opponent, that opponent loses the game. This allows him to activate Nissa's plus one ability, turning a forest into a 4-4 elemental with trample, and attack Chris with the forest, and since Chris can't block enough damage to stop the trample from hitting him, knocks Chris out of the game. Notably, this also removes the two copies of the Captain on Finnegan's board. Then in Eddie's second main phase, he activates Freyalise's minus two ability to destroy Reflections of Litjara, and at the end of turn, Finnegan flashes in Arcane Signet and also activates Nylea, revealing the top card of his library and putting it into his hand if it's a creature, or he may put it into the graveyard. This has him putting Grazalax, a Lithid Scholar, to hand. He then activates Nylea two more times, this time putting a land and haunted one into the graveyard.
Finnegan moves straight to combat on his turn, attacking Eddie for 3 with the Captain, which is unblockable thanks to the Silent Arbiter and Menace, milling Eddie for 3 when it deals damage. Then at the end of turn, Finnegan puts Eddie's Evolution Sage into play under his control since it was milled this turn. On my turn, I again just play a Swamp and pass. But at the end of my turn, Eddie casts Harrow, sacrificing a land to search his library for two basic lands, putting them into play tapped. Unfortunately though, he forgot that he pulled all of his basics out with Nyssa earlier in the game, so he fails to find. When Eddie draws with Sylvan Library, he puts two back, losing no life. And in his first main phase, he casts Ugin the Ineffable, making all his colorless spells cost two less to cast. He activates Ugin's minus three ability, destroying Captain Nagathrod, but in response, Finnegan flashes in overcharged amalgam, exploiting the evolution sage, countering the activated ability, and saving his commander. Eddie then activates Tevishzat's plus one ability, sacrificing a zombie to draw two cards, activates Freyalisa's minus two ability, destroying Leyline of Anticipation and killing the Planeswalker. In response, Finnegan flashes in Grazalix, a Lithid Scholar, and then Eddie gets to look at the top seven cards of his library, putting Garrick the Cursed Huntsman from among them into his hand. He also activates Nissa's plus one ability to untap four forests, and this then allows him to cast Garrick the Cursed Huntsman, drawing a card with Reiki. He immediately ultimates Garrick, gaining an emblem that gives creatures he controls plus three plus three and trample. This also kills the Planeswalker, letting him look at the top seven cards of his library, putting Nissa Vital Force into his hand. He moves to combat, attacking Finnegan with a 7-7 forest with trample, but before damage, Finnegan casts Drown in the Lock to destroy the attacking creature. In Eddie's second main phase, he activates Frasca's plus two ability, sacrificing Elvish Mystic, gaining a life, and drawing a card. He then plays an Ancient Tomb, making a 2-2 zombie, and passes. Finnegan attacks Eddie with Overcharged Amalgam for three, milling him for three, and drawing a card thanks to Grazalax. He then plays a Bajuka Bog, exiling Eddie's Graveyard. In Finnegan's second main phase, he casts Hunted Horror that makes me two 3-3 three, three green centaurs with protection from black. And unfortunately, at this point, Finnegan's internet goes down, so he's forced to concede from the game. So when I draw for my turn, and I realize I have no way to stop Eddie from killing me, I also decide to concede, winning Eddie the game. All right, so that was a sweet first game, but we got to move on to game two, and we'll talk about both of them once we get to the wrap-up. So our second game, we are joined once again by Chris from One More Game, but also by the gentlemen over on Scrat Trawlers, Lenny and Andy. So we have Lenny playing his Marath, Will of the Wild deck, which he didn't talk too much about it when we first started, but I've played against Marath in the past. It's a very terrifying commander, definitely has a lot of combo potential, but Lenny did say he's focused more on the plus one, plus one counters. Even still, I am a little concerned about what this commander can do, so I'm very interested to see how that goes. I'm hoping if it is centered around a combo that ours could maybe just be a little bit faster. Uh, next up, we have Andy with his Thantis the Warweaver deck, which is a goad slash making players attack kind of deck so he wants to make sure that all of his opponents are attacking preferably each other not him and then he can kind of move in and sweep up the pieces so i think we'll be okay with this one because we do have a lot of evasive creatures we have some very large creatures i don't think attacking is going to be too much of an issue for us but we'll see and then finally, we have Chris playing his Tovalar Dire Overlord deck, which is a werewolf tribal deck, so he wants to play as many werewolves as possible, draw a ton of cards, do a ton of damage, and of course, Tovalar, being the most recent werewolf commander, has the daybound side, but also the nightbound side, which has the ability of Kessig Wolf Run on the back, so he can pay X green and red and give target wolf or werewolf plus X plus O and trample until end of turn. And I think that with the goading and with the being forced to attack, that's really going to be an ability to watch out for. So I am concerned about what the werewolves can do as well. But I do think that the big threat here is going to be Thantis with the actual forcing of the attacks, because 
with Thantis on board, you really don't want to swing into Andy, so I'm worried that we're going to take a lot of the brunt of the attacks from the plus one plus one counters and from the werewolves, but we'll see how this goes. I hope you all enjoy it, and I will talk to you all once it's done. At the start of game two, I go first, followed by Lenny, Andy, and then Chris. On my first turn, I play a Mystic Monastery. Lenny plays a Cinder Glade. Andy plays a Forest. Chris plays a Colony Garden, creating a 0-1 plant token. I play a Frontier Bivouac. Lenny plays a Canopy Vista. Andy plays a Swamp and casts Gruel Signet. Chris plays a Mountain and casts Kessig Naturalist, making it Day and allowing Chris to add a red or green mana whenever it attacks. I cast an Arcane Signet and then play a Swamp. Lenny plays a Forest and casts Cultivate, searching his library for two basic lands, putting them into play tapped. Andy plays a Mountain and casts Swift Foot Boots. Chris plays a Forest and casts his commander Tovalar Dire Overlord, allowing him to draw a card when a werewolf does combat damage to a player and can also turn at night, transforming all werewolves in his upkeep if he has three or more werewolves. He then moves to combat, attacking Lenny for two and drawing a card. Then, at the end of turn, I wizard cycle step through, searching my library for a wizard and putting it into my hand. This lets me get a Sararak the Arch Lich. On my turn, I play a Plains and cast Cloud Blazer, gaining two life and drawing two cards. Lenny plays a Forest and then casts and kicks a Grow from the Ashes, searching his library for two basic lands, putting them into play untapped. Andy casts a Soul Ring, plays a Forest, and then casts his commander Thantis the Warweaver, forcing all creatures to attack each turn if able, and also getting a plus one plus one counter on it whenever Andy is attacked. Chris casts a Commander Sphere, and then attacks me for 5 with both of his werewolves, and Lenny for 0 with a plant to send a message. I block the Naturalist with Cloud Blazer, killing both creatures while I take 3 damage from Tovalar and Chris draws a card. In Chris's second main phase, he casts a Stryonic Resonator, allowing him to pay 2 to copy a triggered ability. On my turn, I play a Crumbling Necropolis and cast Marauding Raptor, making all my creatures cost one less to cast and doing two damage to any creature I play. I then cast a Mistform Warchief, making any creature that shares a type with it cost one less to cast and can also tap to make itself into any other creature type until the end of turn. Lenny plays a Mountain and casts his commander, Marath, Will of the Wild, which enters with X plus one plus one counters equal to the mana spent to cast it, and Lenny can remove X plus one plus one counters to put X plus one plus one counters on target creature, do X damage to target creature, or make an XX elemental creature token. Andy equips the Swiftfoot Boots to Thantis, giving it haste and hexproof, and then casts a Geode Rager, which goads all creatures target opponent controls whenever a land enters under Andy's control. He then immediately plays a mountain and goads all of my creatures before moving to combat and attacking Chris for 5 with Thantis. On Chris's turn, he casts an unnatural moonrise, making it night, transforming Tovalar, giving him plus 1 plus 0, and letting Chris draw a card if Tovalar deals combat damage to an opponent this turn. He follows that up by casting Rabid Bite, having Tovalar deal 5 damage to Geode Rager killing it. He then moves to combat and attacks Lenny for 4 with Tovalar and me for 0 with the plant. Lenny blocks with Marath and, before damage, casts a Solidarity of Heroes, doubling the number of counters on it, making it a 6-6 and killing Tovalar. On my turn I play a Mountain and then activate Mistform Warchief, turning it into a wizard until the end of turn. Then I commast my commander, Morophon, the Boundless, naming Wizard when it enters to give all wizards plus one plus one, and makes wizards cost one of each color mana less to cast. 
This makes Sararak the Archlich completely free to cast, so I attempt to go infinite and venture into the dungeon until I drain all of my opponents out. Unfortunately though, Lenny is able to stop it by removing 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters from Marath, doing 3 damage to Marauding Raptor, killing it, and making a Sararak cost 1 generic mana instead of being free. However, I do still venture into the Lost Mine of Fandelver, scrying 1, and then a Sararak returns to my hand. Since I still have 2 mana left, I cast a Sararak 2 more times, venturing twice, making a treasure token, making each opponent lose a life, gaining a life, and then spending the treasure to cast a Sararak one more time, drawing a card, completing the dungeon, and ending with a Sararak bounced back to my hand. On Lenny's turn, he cast a Cloaked Cadet, which draws Lenny a card once a turn whenever a plus one plus one counter is put on a human he controls. He then attacks Chris for three with Marath, and removes a plus one plus one counter from Marath, putting it on Cloaked Cadet, drawing a card. Andy plays a mountain, and attacks Chris for 5 with Thantis, and passes. Chris plays a Rogue's Passage, and casts Burnished Heart, followed up by casting Lamb Holt Pacifist, which can't attack unless Chris controls a creature with power 4 or greater. He then moves to combat, attacking Andy for 0, putting a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Thantis. On my turn I cast Wild Research, which allows me to search my library for an instant or enchantment, put it into my hand, and then discard a card at random. I immediately activate it, searching my library for an enchantment, in this case Arcane Adaptation, putting it into my hand and then discarding a card at random, which in this case is a Swamp. I then play a Forest, and cast the Arcane Adaptation, naming Wizards, to turn all creatures in my deck and in play into Wizards. I also activate the Warchief to make itself a Kavu until end of turn, making it unable to attack. Morophon, however, still has to attack, so I send my commander at Lenny for 7, but before blocks, he activates Marath, removing a plus 1 plus 1 counter from him to make a 1 1 elemental, blocking Morophon and taking no damage. Then at the end of turn, Lenny removes the last counter from Marath, killing his commander, putting a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Cloaked Cadet, and drawing a card. Lenny plays a command tower and recasts his commander Marath, putting 5 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. He then removes a plus 1 plus 1 counter from Marath and puts it on Cloaked Cadet to draw a card. He moves to combat, attacking me for 5, and then, at the end of turn, Andy casts Return of the Wild Speaker to draw 6 cards since he has a creature with 6 power. On Andy's turn, he plays a Swamp, and casts Fiend Lash, equipping it to Thantis, giving him plus 2 plus 0, and also doing damage equal to his power whenever he's dealt damage. After that, he moves to combat, attacking Lenny for 8, but Lenny again removes a counter from Marath to make a 1-1 elemental token, blocking Thantis and taking no damage. However, when Thantis is dealt damage, it does 8 damage to Lenny's face anyway. On Chris's turn, he plays a Command Tower, and then sacrifices his Burnished Heart, searching his library for two basic lands, putting them into play tapped. In response, Lenny removes a counter from his commander, putting it onto the Cadet, and drawing a card. Chris then casts an Inquisitor's Flail, and attacks me for zero with the Plant Token. I play a Forest, and cast a Sararak, returning him to my hand a total of 4 times since he only costs 1 mana. This lets me scry 1, make a treasure token, gain a life, have each of my opponents lose a life, and draw a card. While that's going on, Lanny responds by removing a counter from Marath, putting it on the cadet and drawing a card. Once I finish the dungeon and draw a card, I'm able to cast the card I drew, Jota Archmage Eternal, letting me cast spells by spending 1 mana of each color rather than paying their mana costs. This, combined with Morophon, makes all wizards, including a Sararak, free to cast. However, when I try to go infinite with a Sararak, Andy responds by casting Terminate to destroy the Arch Lich, only allowing me to scry one. I then move to combat and attack Chris for two, and Lenny for six with Morophon. Both of them block, preventing the damage, and only killing Marath. 
Lenny plays a forest and casts Citadel Siege, choosing cons so that at the start of combat on his turn, he gets to put two plus one plus one counters on target creature he controls, which he immediately does, putting the counters on Cloaked Cadet and drawing a card. He then attacks me for nine with the Cadet, and in his second main phase, casts a Hopeful Initiate, which can remove two counters from among creatures he controls to destroy an artifact or enchantment. He also casts a Cryptic Trilobite for X equals 1, so it enters with 1 plus 1 plus 1 counter. Then, at the end of turn, Andy cycles a Migration Path. Andy plays a Swamp, and casts Mirror Shield, equipping it to Thantis, giving him Hexproof and plus 0 plus 2, also destroying any creature with Death Touch that blocks him. He moves to combat, attacking me for a total of 8 with Thantis. Chris recasts his commander Tovalar, Dire Overlord, and sacrifices Commander Sphere to draw a card. He then casts an Obelisk of Erd, tapping his creatures to help pay for it with Convoke, giving all his werewolves plus two plus two. On my turn, I Sliver cycle a Homing Sliver, searching my library for a Sliver, in this case a Dormant Sliver, and putting it into my hand. I cast the Dormant Sliver, giving all Slivers Defender, and when they enter the battlefield, their controller draws a card, drawing me a card when the Dormant Sliver enters. I also cast Ephemerate, exiling Morophon and returning it to play, again naming Wizards, but also drawing a card since it's also a Sliver. I then cast Mindstone, and Rampant Growth, searching my library for a basic land, putting it into play tapped. I move to combat, attacking Lenny for 5 in the air, and Chris for 2. Then at the end of turn, Lenny activates his initiate, removing 2 counters from Cloaked Cadet to destroy Andy's Fiendlash. On Lenny's turn, he taps his Cryptic Trilobite to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it, and then moves to combat, triggering Citadel Siege, putting 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on the Cryptic Trilobite. He attacks Chris with the Cadet and the Initiate, putting a counter on the Initiate thanks to its training ability. He draws a card with the Cadet, and then does 9 total damage to Chris. In Lenny's second main phase, he recasts his Commander Marath, which comes in with 7 plus 1 plus 1 counters. Andy plays a Forest, and casts Vengeful Ancestor, which goads target creature when it enters the battlefield or attacks, also doing 1 damage to any opponent who attacks with a goaded creature. With this particular trigger, Andy goads Marath. He moves to combat, attacking Lenny for 8 with Thantis, but before blocks, Lenny removes a counter from the Trilobite, making 2 colorless mana. He then uses 1 of that mana to remove a counter from Marath, putting it on the Cadet and drawing a card. The other mana is used to remove a counter from Marath, creating a 1-1 elemental token, which blocks Thantis, so Lenny takes no damage. In Andy's second main phase, he casts Goblin and Narcomancer, making his red and green spells cost one less to cast. Chris plays a forest, and equips Inquisitor's Flail to Tovalar, doubling all damage that would be dealt to and dealt by his commander. He also activates Rogue's Passage, making Tovalar unblockable until the end of turn, and attacks me for zero with the plant, and Andy with Tovalar and the Pacifist. This puts two plus one plus one counters on Thantis, which blocks the Pacifist, killing it, while Andy takes ten from Tovalar and Chris draws a card. At the end of turn, I activate Wild Research, searching my library for an enchantment, Conspiracy, putting it into my hand, and then discarding a card at random, which winds up being a jungle shrine. Still at the end of turn, Lenny removes a counter from the Trilobite, making two colorless mana, which allows him to remove two counters from Marath, putting one back on the Trilobite and another on the Cadet, drawing a card. In my upkeep, Ephemerate rebounds, allowing me to again exile Morophon and return him to play, again naming wizards, and drawing a card when he comes in. I then cast Conspiracy, naming Sliver, making all creatures in my deck Slivers. I sacrifice the Mind Stone to draw a card, I also cast Ancestral Statue, attempting to infinitely draw my deck since it's a Sliver, drawing me a card when it enters, returns itself to my hand, and can be cast for free thanks to Morophon and Joda. 
Unfortunately, Lenny has an answer, removing a counter from the trilobite to activate Hopeful Initiate, destroying Ancestral Statue with the bounce trigger on the stack, however I do still get to draw one card. After that I activate Wild Research, searching my library for an enchantment, in this case Nylea Keen-Eyed, putting it to my hand and then discarding a card at random, which ends up being a Kefnet's Monument. I cast the Nylea Keen-Eyed, making all my creatures cost one less, and letting me pay three to look at the top card of my library and put it into my hand if it's a creature, or into the graveyard. At the end of turn, Lenny reinforces with Break Ties, putting a plus one plus one counter on Cloaked Cadet, drawing a card. On Lenny's turn, he plays a Plains, and casts Wild Growth, enchanting a Plains, letting it tap for an additional green mana. He follows that up by casting Abzan Falconer, giving all his creatures with plus one plus one counters flying. He also casts a Collective Effort, escalating it with Hopeful Initiate and Abzan Falconer, tapping them and choosing all three modes. This lets him put a plus one plus one counter on all of his creatures, destroy Morophon, and destroy Arcane Adaptation. Once that resolves, he draws a card with Cloak Cadet since a counter was put on it, and also taps Cryptic Trilobite, putting a plus one plus one counter on it. He moves to combat, attacking Andy for 10 with the Cadet, putting a counter on Thantis, and attacks Chris for 5 with Morath, which also does 1 to Lenny since Morath was goaded. At this point we also remember the Citadel Siege triggered, so Lenny puts two plus one plus one counters on the Trilobite. Andy plays a Mountain, and attacks Lenny with everything, goading the Cloaked Cadet. Before blocks though, Lenny removes two counters from the Trilobite to remove four counters from Morath, putting one on Abzan Falconer, drawing a card since it's a human, and making three elemental tokens. He then uses the elementals to block, taking no damage. On Chris's turn, he casts Tormenting Voice, discarding a card and drawing two. And at this point, we also realize that Andy casts no spells on his turn, making it night and transforming Tovalar. He moves to combat, attacking Lenny for 12 with Tovalar and me for 0 with the plant. When Tovalar deals damage, Chris activates Stryonic Resonator to copy his ability, drawing 2 cards. Then at the end of Chris's turn, I activate Nylea, revealing the top card of my library, which winds up being an Azorius Signet, putting it into the graveyard since it's not a creature. On my turn I recast my commander Morophon, naming Slivers and drawing a card. I also cast Oketra's Monument, making my white creatures cost one less to cast, and also creating a 1-1 warrior token whenever I cast a creature spell. I then play Evolving Wilds, sacrificing it to search my library and put a basic land into play tapped. On Lenny's turn, he plays an Exotic Orchard, and moves to combat, putting two plus one plus one counters on Morath. He winds up attacking Chris with his entire board for a total of 23 damage, knocking Chris out of the game. This also does one damage to Lenny, thanks to the Vengeful Ancestor, puts a counter on the Hopeful Initiate, and draws Lenny a card. In his second main phase, he casts Shatter the Sky, destroying all creatures, but letting each player draw a card, since we all control a creature with power 4 or greater. And he also casts Grumgully the Generous, putting a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each non-human that enters under his control. He casts a Ranging Raptor, which comes in with a plus 1 plus 1 counter, and also allows Lenning to search his library for a basic land, and put it into play tapped whenever the Raptor is dealt damage. Andy plays an Evolving Wilds, and recasts his commander Thantis, immediately equipping him with the Swift Foot Boots. This lets him move to combat and attack Lenny for 5, but Lenny blocks with the Ranging Raptors, killing the dinosaur, but letting him search his library for a basic land and put it into play tapped. Then Andy sacrifices his Evolving Wilds to also search his library for a basic land and put it into play tapped. At the end of turn, I activate Wild Research to search my library for an enchantment, in this case Impact Tremors, put it into my hand, and then discard a card at random, which unfortunately ends up being the Impact Tremors.
On my turn, I play a Plains and activate Nylea a total of three times, revealing a Forest, Selesnia Signet, and Savage Lands, putting them all to the graveyard. Once that's resolved, I cast Izzet Signet, followed up by casting Gruul Signet. Lenny plays a Game Trail and casts Herd Bayloth, which creates a 4-4 Beast token whenever a plus one plus one counter is put onto it, which immediately happens when it enters thanks to Grumgully, making a 4-4 Beast, which also gets a counter from Grumgully. He then moves to combat, putting two more plus one plus one counters on Herd Bayloth, and creating another 4-4 Beast, which also gets a plus one plus one counter. He attacks me for three with Grumgully, and then moves to his second main phase, where he casts a Pride Malkin, and the Pride Malkin enters with a plus one plus one counter, putting another counter on the Herd Bayloth, creating another 4-4 Beast that also gets a counter, and giving all his creatures with plus one plus one counters trample. Andy plays a Forest, and attacks me for five with Thantis. Then, in his second main phase, he casts Agitator Ant, allowing each player to put two plus one plus one counters on a creature they control during Andy's end step. However, any creature that gets the counters is goaded. Andy then moves to his end step, triggering the Ant, so he puts two counters on Thantis, while Lenny puts two counters on Herd Bayloth, making another 4-4 Beast that also gets a counter. On my turn, I play an Island, and recast Morophon, again naming Slivers, and activate Nylea, revealing a forest and putting it into the graveyard. Lenny casts an Armorcraft Judge, which comes in with a plus one plus one counter, and then draws him nine cards since he controls nine creatures with plus one plus one counters on them. After that, he plays a Forge of Heroes, and casts a Warstorm Surge, which does damage to any target equal to the power of any creature that enters under Lenny's control. He also casts Together Forever, putting a plus one plus one counter on Grumgully and Herd Bayloth, making another 4-4 with a plus one plus one counter, allowing Lenny to do five damage to Andy when it enters. After that, he casts Ordeal of Nylea on Herd Bayloth, allowing him to put a plus one plus one counter on it when it attacks, then sacrificing the enchantment and searching for two basic lands if it has three or more counters on it. He moves to combat, putting two counters on Herd Bayloth, making another 4-4 Beast with a counter on it, doing 5 damage to Andy. This allows Lenny to attack both Andy and I for more than enough damage to kill us both, especially since everything has Trample, winning Lenny the game. Alright, so those were a couple of super sweet games. Like I said earlier, very long games, so I appreciate you sticking through that, but very, very fun games, and I'm very happy that I got to play with these awesome groups of people. Hopefully, we can do so again in the future. Uh, game number one for our deck, we really didn't get to do too much, unfortunately. There were a couple of moments where we drew combo pieces and didn't have much to do with it. Um, I definitely named the wrong creature type with Morophon a couple of times. The downside to kind of blind naming a creature type is not knowing what you're going to draw off the top, and so with Morophon I had named Kavu, but at one point if I had named Slivers we could have gone infinite, drew our deck, and just won. So a little bit of downside there, but I think everyone else's deck in game one really did what they wanted to do. Um, Chris unfortunately couldn't really get rolling, he kept having to kind of sacrifice his creatures and couldn't do too much over there. Um, Finnegan probably could have wound up winning the game if his internet hadn't crashed, so it is a shame that Finnegan had to drop out. Hopefully we can get Finnegan back for some games to kind of avenge that loss in the future. And I was definitely right when I said that Eddie's Karth deck was going to be problematic, because it's Super Friends have lost to Karth so many times in the past, so no big surprise there, but very, very cool, and it was very sweet to see him ultimate so many Planeswalkers. That's not a common thing you get to see, even from Super Friends decks, so super cool to watch that and then for game two uh the the scrap trawlers in particular really tried to stop me from comboing off that game i tried to go infinite three separate times and even toward the end of the game i was drawing uh live to any creature that could bounce itself like shrieking drake or white mane lion i had the ability to win if i had been able to find it 
that ability to win went down the hill a little bit once I discarded the um, impact tremors, but you never know. So very cool that I at least attempted to do it three times, and I think that really shows the resiliency of the deck that I attempted to infinitely combo three separate times with three separate cards. So very, very cool, and big props to both Lenny and Andy for stopping that from happening. Um, I think Lenny and Andy's decks both really did very powerful things and were able to keep the game going with combat and being able to make a ton of counters. And Lenny's Cloaked Cadet was like the MVP of that game. I don't know how many cards it drew him throughout the course of the game, but I think without that Cloaked Cadet, he probably wouldn't have had the resources to actually win. And then Chris's Werewolf deck got stuck on lands at the very beginning, but toward the end it was swinging in for a ton of damage and Tovalar himself was swinging in for like 12 damage each time because of the Inquisitor's Flail so I think that if he'd been able to get a couple more lands at the beginning or just a couple more creatures that could have blocked so we didn't keep hitting him over and over because of Thantis I really think the werewolves could have pulled out that game in a very surprising uh, turn of events considering there weren't too many creatures on board he really only had tovalar and maybe one or two other creatures but he was still swinging for you know a dozen damage every single turn so very very impressive showing by all of the decks um very happy with how ours turned out but as always if you are interested in seeing future videos like this please do like the video and subscribe to the channel lets me know that people are interested and if you have any suggestions for future cards that you would like to see turned into decks for this video played on the channel please do put them in the comments below i'd love to hear about it and of course let me know what you think about the deck what you thought about everyone else's decks the games the uh deck tech itself i'd love to hear everyone's comments but with all of that being said Hope you all enjoyed it, and I will see you all on the other side of the Dungeon Learner's Guide.